right, uh, welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us for the Town of Tallinn's uh, Community Resilience Building Workshop number two, which is part of um, the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness and um, uh, Hazard Mitigation Plan update process. Just before we get into anything further, just wanted to give everybody um, a heads up on notes on virtual participation. Uh, as you are aware, since you are joining us, this meeting is being hosted on Zoom. Um, hopefully everybody was able to join okay, particularly with regard to the audio, but if not, please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions um, for assistance with uh, connections. Um, it's a fairly small group tonight, so I know this slide says to use the chat box for technical questions, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I think feel free to, to say anything, just like, uh, like once again, uh, we have an interloper um, <laughs> coming to join. Uh, um, yep, okay, good night. <laughs> Um, so feel free to unmute yourself and just ask a question at any time if you uh, during the presentation or at any other point, um, although you are also welcome to use the chat box if you feel more comfortable doing so. And do keep an eye on that chat box. Um, I may post some links in there if uh, people want to see any uh, particular documents or maps at any other point. And as I mentioned, and as you would have seen the notification, this meeting is being recorded. The meeting slides are available um, after the presentation um, on the Town of Tallinn's MVP committee website, or um, if you put your email address in the chat, I would be happy to directly email you a PDF of the presentation slides as well. Uh, before we get any further, um, I would like to just do some, a quick round of introductions. Uh, my name is Emily Tully. I am a senior planner at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and I am happy to be helping the Town of Tallinn's MVP HMP committee with going through this process. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to be here joining you again tonight. Um, we then maybe go to Mimi. Hi everyone, Mimi Kaplan, um, senior planner at PVPC and hopping out tonight, taking notes once we're at that stage. Looking forward to the conversation. Hey everyone, Jacinta Williams, Andy's planner, helping to facilitate the chat room and just any other technical issues that might come up. Nice to see you all again. Uh, Jeff LaCasse, the Thailand Emergency Management Director, and also the Deputy Chief on the Fire Department. Jennifer Avalan Kershaw, I am the Emergency Management uh, Director for the Town of Heartland, Connecticut. Pat Story, Tallinn, Council on Aging and Finance Committee. Jim Deming, Tallinn Planning. Uh, Kate Donovan, Superintendent of Public Works at Tallinn. Paula Sharon. Resident of Tolland and member of VRT, um, Voices Rising Together, a local grassroots group um, working towards environmental justice. Hi, we're Regina and Les Cohn, and we're residents of Tolland. Oh, thanks for joining. I thought I saw Steve in the waiting room. Are you able to join us, Steve? I am, but just uh, by voice. Steve Delagistina, Town of Tallinn, uh, Select Board member. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate that. I also oh, uh, want to say a quick thank you to the Town of Tallinn's Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness and Hazard Mitigation Plan Committee. Uh, they've been working really hard kind of behind the scenes to uh, keep this process moving and uh, have been doing uh, a fair number of meetings and, and work. So um, thank you to everybody on this list who has been participating in that process. 
So tonight our agenda um, is going to basically be alternating between uh, some brief presentation on my part and then some group exercises where we'll work together. So first I'll start off with a presentation where I will introduce um, and give an overview of the MVP HMP process, the grant that the town of Tolland got, which is funding this work, um, and an introduction to climate change and how it's impacting natural hazards and specifically natural hazards that are impacting the town of Tolland. For those of you who participated in the first workshop, um, a lot of this will be uh, the same as what I presented last time, so I apologize for the repetition, but hopefully it will be helpful to those of you who weren't able to join us for the first workshop. And um, as I said before, if you have any questions during this presentation, feel free to enter them into the chat and Jacinta will read them out for you or uh, raise your hand or just unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, it doesn't need to be a formal presentation. You can, you're welcome to interrupt me at any time. After that, we will then work together to develop an inventory of the environmental strengths and vulnerabilities of the town of Tolland relative to natural hazards and resilience to natural hazards. Uh, after we do that, we'll take a quick break and then I will give a brief overview presentation of what mitigation actions are in the context of the MVP program and what types are generally competitive for funding under the MVP action grant program. And then we'll go back to a group exercise to brainstorm mitigation actions to address those environmental strengths and vulnerabilities that we came up with earlier. And then we will end with just a very brief wrap up presentation where we'll talk about the topic for the last workshop, workshop three, and follow up actions, which will include a survey um, that will be online to prioritize the mitigation actions that we come up with during this workshop process. So why are we here? Why are we doing this three workshop process? Well, the town of Tolland has received a grant from the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program to develop an MVP plan and also to update the existing hazard mitigation plan, which was last updated in 2016, in order to improve the preparedness of the town um, and its resilience to natural hazard events. What do we mean by when we say resilience to natural hazard events? Um, I thought this graph would be kind of a, a good way to think about it. Um, so if you're a less resilient community, then you know, you're kind of going along business as usual and then some sort of acute hazard, some major natural hazard event happens, maybe like a tornado or a severe winter storm. Your business as usual, your functional capacity, your ability to function as a town in kind of every respect drops down and then it rebounds and you recover. But if you're not a resilient community, then your recovery means that you're not recovering to the same level as you were before the natural hazard event. And you have this gap, this permanent loss. When you're a more resilient community, then you make these investments to build resilience so that when there is a natural hazard event, you do have that loss in functional capacity right after the event, but you can see the return, the recovery period is much shorter, and then you're able to get back to where you started or maybe even better, and that is resiliency. So we have this quote here, which is a quote from the uh, MVP program, which is that resilient uh, communities don't just recover from natural hazard events. They are continuously improving their capacity to reduce the impacts of future climate and natural hazard events. So we're addressing the needs of your built social and natural environment to anticipate, cope with, and then rebound stronger from these events. Through the MVP process, we are creating strategies to mitigate those potential impacts of climate change exacerbated natural hazards in the town of Tolens. The planning grant process is a community driven process, which is why we are doing these, um, what we've been calling the community resilience building workshops or CRB workshops, which are a specific workshop framework developed by the Nature Conservancy intended to incorporate as many different voices from the community as possible. And we are doing that so that we can get a full picture of the sense of climate and natural hazard vulnerabilities uh, and priorities in the community so that we can identify these mitigation or adaptation actions. We are using this community driven process and uh, climate data to develop an MVP plan 
through these workshops and outreach to the community. And at the end of the process, Tolland will be designated as an MVP community, which will make it eligible for action grant funding from the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Uh, so you submit these yearly progress reports, and then every year there's an opportunity to apply uh, to the program to implement the actions that were identified as priority actions. Uh, for example, right now we are currently in the open action grant period for MVP designated communities, and uh, the average award is between $25,000 and up to $3 million for an, for an individual community uh, for implementation of a priority action. And it's up to $5 million for um, a regional project. So not an insubstantial amount of money to implement actions that are identified as a priority for making your community more resilient to natural hazards. One of the reasons that this is a priority is because the amount of natural hazards, the degree and severity, and even the type are changing. I used a different graph this uh, last time to talk about the trends of natural hazards. Um, and I thought this one was an interesting one to share, to look at it in a different way. So this is a graph from uh, climate.gov, which is the uh, US government's climate clearinghouse website that has you know, all sorts of uh, data and, and facts and graphs and maps. And this is looking at uh, between 1980 and 2021, the cost of disaster events. And it's adjusted uh, you know, for CPI, so it's adjusted for inflation so that everything's all relative to each other. And what you're seeing on this graph, we've got months of the year um, over time, and then billions, billions with a B of dollars on the side axis. And the reason that some of these are colored and a lot of these are gray lines is because we're looking at the, um, and emphasizing the years that were the costliest in terms of natural disasters. And if we're looking at this period of the last 41 years between 1980 and 2021, then the top five, um, how many is this, six, the top six years, um, most of them have been extremely recent. So 2018, 2020, 2012, 2005, 2017, 2021. Whereas in the previous period, you know, these are all significantly lower years in terms of the cost of natural disasters. What is this implying? Well, it's implying that the uh, damages from natural hazards are increasing as we go through time. Uh, that's because as we get these continued trends and changes in our temperature, rainfall, uh, seasonality, um, these changes are influencing natural hazards and how often they occur and also their severity. So you can see it's not just that we're having more events than any one single year, but it's even that the severity of the events is dramatically increasing. You can see here uh, in 2017, um, there's a big gap between two events in August and in September, uh, you know, hurricanes um, that were extremely costly in, in how they occurred because of changes in sea level rise um, and the, uh, how much water is coming inland as a result of these hurricanes. So these are trends that are, are pretty scary to think about, you know, that we're, we're increasing the cost of our natural hazard events. And so if we then kind of think about how natural hazards are occurring more frequently and more severely, and they're costing a lot more money, then suddenly, you know, this slide makes a lot more sense. If we're putting money to our investments to build that resilience, then we're uh, preventing that permanent loss, those costs associated with uh, uh, both the length of time of recovery and the gap between our recovery uh, state and our previous business as usual state. Statewide, specifically the changes that we've seen um, since 1895, temperature has gone up by three degrees. We've increased our growing season by almost two weeks, which is uh, since 1950 which is um, you know, one of the, the bright spots, I suppose, in all of this. Uh, we have seen, uh, this is, it looks a little weird, but this is actually an abbreviation for inches. So sea level rise, has, sea level's gone up 11 inches since 1922, um, so almost a foot. And we've seen an increase in heavy precipitation of 55% since 1958, which is one that really impacts this region in particular. So those are changes that we've observed so far uh, by the end of the century. We are predicting um, that there's going to be an annual average increase across the state in our temperature of about seven degrees. 
We are anticipating an increase in our days over 90 degrees, our high heat days of more than a month. Uh, the sea level rise is uh, a pretty wide range because it depends on a lot of factors, including um, you know, the sinking of the land uh, for areas that are built on fill and also actually some glacial rebound. Um, but it's anticipated to be anywhere between four to 10 feet above the mean sea level as measured in the year 2000, which is incredibly substantial. Uh, and then overall, we're going to see an increase in heavy precipitation, um, particularly storms over two inches of 47% every year. These projected changes are based on climate models developed by the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center at UMass Amherst. Um, and they're using uh, various ranges of greenhouse gas emission scenarios. Um, and then they look at them both statewide in the state hazard and climate adaptation plan and then scale them down to different. Oh, go ahead, Pat. A question on your heavy yeah. precipitation number, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, this is the number of big storms, but not the total amount of precipitation. Is that correct? They, I probably shouldn't have put them in the same row because you're right there. Too. So the amount of heavy precipitation overall, yes, uh, the amount of storms have gone, have gone up. 55, yeah, you're right, 55% since 1958. And in this case, the amount of, the number of storms that will result in two inches or more of precipitation in one day is going to go up by 47% annually. Okay, so but it's we're not necessarily gonna get more rain annually. It is complicated, <laughs> you're, you're right. Uh, this area will see, is anticipated to see more rainfall, but it is going, the, precipitation patterns have changed such that that rainfall is going to occur in fewer bigger events and then we'll have longer dry stretches in between those rainfall events. Um, Thank you. Overall, I think this area is expected to see more precipitation as a whole, but for the state it is complicated because you'll get these dry stretches in between the big storms. Um, so the overall amount of precipitation is not drastically different from right now. It's just how we get it that's really the big difference. Thanks, Pat. Uh, one of the really big differences that we see in our particular river basin, which is the Farmington River Basin for the most part, is the annual days over 90 degrees are high heat days. This graph is from the Commonwealth's Climate Change Clearinghouse, which is resilientma.org. It's a really cool website. I definitely suggest that you check it out and play around with it. It's got all of these different um, factors that you can look at, like days over 90, days over 95 degrees, your average annual temperature. Um, and you can look at them for all sorts of different river basins across the state, both in a map form and in this graph, graph form. Um, and you can kind of hover over it and it'll tell you the actual data point for any year that you're interested in. Um, but so what we're looking at here is uh, we've got our um, days over 90 degrees here. Oops, sorry if I put that on your screen. Uh, on the left. And then we've got the year on the bottom. The different colors represent different scenarios for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the blue one is best case scenario with low greenhouse gas emissions. Gray is the median. And red is uh, worst case scenario. The gray dots are uh, what has been observed to date. So you can see it's rather low for the Farmington River Basin as you might expect, um, especially if you've lived there for a long time. There just really aren't that many days over 90 degrees. I think the um, observed annual uh, was three, something on the order of three. So in the period of 2020 to 2041, we're expected to increase that amount by uh, a week. And then if we're looking more toward the end of the century, uh, we could go up to as many as almost 19 days um, above what has previously been observed uh, between 1971 and 2000. And that's for the median. And so then if we're looking worst case scenario, we're talking more on the order of 80 more days over 90 degrees. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but when we are, so we're here a little bit past 2020 and our current observations are putting us more in the red range rather than in the more optimistic blue range. So um, uh, a severe upward trend in the number of days over 90 degrees, which I think um, is, is pretty clear in terms of what the negative impacts of that might be. You know, you're gonna be, um, have more 
potential for wildfire risk. You're going to put folks who are at risk for heat related diseases like heat stroke or heat exhaustion. Um, they're gonna be in more danger from this like um, uh, small children and people who are elderly and folks who work outside. Um, and you're also going to increase the use of energy because people are going to be using air conditioning and cooling mechanisms more. And so then there's going to be both the potential for rolling blackouts and then also the additional pollution associated with that air pollution. Uh, correspondingly, as you might expect, we're also losing our days below freezing, our days below 32 degrees. Kind of similar to the previous graph, we've got years along the bottom axis and our days that we have below 32 on the side axis. Uh, the beginning part of the graph is our observations, um, well, what we have recorded to date. And then we've got our trends here of uh, kind of, in this case, it's the uh, best case scenario on the top and worst case scenario on the bottom and um, the median in the middle. And the uh, currently the Farmington Basin used to see 162 days below 32 degrees. So a fair amount of the year where you would get below 32 degrees. But by the end of the century, uh, that's expected to change by about a month. So a really significant change in the seasonality, you know, and what your winter feels like, how long it is and what it feels like in the Farmington River Basin that the town of Tolland is in. The negative impacts from that, I think are a little less obvious at first for folks, but uh, once you start thinking about, oops, I'm sorry. Once you start thinking about it, there are quite a bit. Um, you're going to be impacting uh, winter sports and winter recreation in quite a big way. If you're not getting these extended stretches below 32 degrees, it means you won't be building up the ice in your ponds and so you won't get ice fishing. It'll be harder. You'll have more precipitation in the winter that occurs as rain instead of snow. And so winter sports that rely on snow like snowshoeing and snowmobiling will be um, harder to do or have a shorter season. Uh, even things like maple sugaring will be impacted. There are also uh, corresponding pretty big impacts to invasive species and disease vector species. So the ability of uh, species like ticks to live for longer and not get killed off by that cold weather in the winter um, are really going to be impacted. The other big change in this area that Pat and I were talking about earlier is the change in the patterns of precipitation in this area. Uh, this is something we talked about uh, a fair bit last time. The, really, the way to think about it is that we have already uh, observed a change to a more monsoonal form of precipitation than this area used to receive. And what I mean by that is that we used to get our rainfall in many light rainfall events, a lot of small rainfall events throughout the year, you know, pretty well distributed. But it, we are already seeing a change to this pattern where we have long dry stretches followed by very intense brief rainstorm events. These rainstorm events have a bunch of different names uh, based on the modeling that's related to the probability of their occurrence. Uh, up here on this slide, I have what I'm calling the 100 year storm. You also can more accurately refer to it as the 1% annual chance storm. Uh, the reason I'm saying that's more accurate than the 100 year storm is because I think in a lot of people's minds, when you say 100 year storm, you're implying that it only occurs once every 100 years. And that's really not the case. You can get two 100 year storms back to back, or you can get a 100 year storm followed up immediately by a 500 year storm. Um, it, it just relates to the amount of precipitation and the annual likelihood that that storm, a storm of that size will occur. Um, for reference, uh, Tropical Storm Irene was a 500 year storm. So in this case, what this map is showing is uh, how much rainfall is predicted by an engineering model called TP40, which was developed in the 1950s and is still used by engineers today um, for the 100 year storm, a, a fairly large size storm. And it's the difference between that large size storm, how much rainfall is predicted in the existing model uh, from the 50s versus the much more modern model developed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration called NOAA 14. And what it's showing is that NOAA 14 is predicting that the amount of rainfall associated with the 100 year storm in this area is 35% bigger than the 100 year storm as predicted by the 1950 model. So there's a huge discrepancy in the amount of rainfall with these larger storms from the uh, previous model that is still kind of on the books and required to be used uh, versus a more modern model. It's saying that 
this 100 year storm is that much bigger. What's really kind of intense about this is that NOAA 14 actually doesn't really incorporate a lot of um, uh, climate change projections into its model. And so there are actually some calls for using even larger precipitation models that they call NOAA 14 plus or the Cornell extreme precipitation model in order to more accurately predict what these larger storms will look like in the future. So the gap between this previous model and more modern rainfall models for these bigger storms could be even larger than this 35% uh, in this region. Uh, this is you know, a little alarming because this is what is used to size stormwater systems and road stream crossings like culverts and bridges uh, at present. So that's a lot of scary numbers, a lot of scary talk. And what does it actually mean for the town of Tolland? In the town of Tolland in particular, the MVP HMP committee has been meeting, as I mentioned earlier, and we have talked about what are the natural hazards that have occurred in the past and are occurring at present and are likely to occur in the future given the climate change trends for this region. And we've come up with um, a pretty complex table of different natural hazards and the likelihood that they will occur and the severity of their impacts if they were to occur. And I've come up with these top four kind of categories for natural hazards that are most likely to have an adverse impact on the town of Tolland. Those include severe winter storms or nor'easters, which are functionally the same thing, just meteorologically coming from a different direction, different source. Uh, severe thunderstorms, which also can include high wind events or tornadoes. Uh, flooding, which can be both from rivers and streams and overland flooding from stormwater. And then wildfires or brush fires were elevated to a top hazard in Tolland because of the extreme abundance of uh, forest that you guys are blessed with in town and the uh, damage that were to occur if an event were to take place. The reason that we're thinking about these is because the risk of these natural hazards is changing due to all of those uh, changes in trends that we are seeing for climate change. So for example, our severe winter storms and our easters, um, these are being impacted as we're losing those days below freezing and more of our winter precipitation is occurring as rain and then freezing. And so we're getting a lot of impacts on our roads from these storms and also on tree branches. Severe thunderstorms, wind events, and tornadoes are being affected by those changes in rainfall patterns. And uh, as they're changing from less to less frequent but more intense rainfall events, which is then also impacting flooding. You know, that uh, map I showed you and that discrepancy between the previous model and more modern models on uh, how much rainfall we're expecting from these big rainfall events uh, affecting our, our stream crossings and stormwater systems. And then those wildfires or brush fires are becoming more likely as we're getting these long dry stretches and higher heat days. So what do we do with all of this information? Well, we are taking that, um, those top hazards and where they occur, how the extent is expected to be, where there were previous occurrences, how likely they are to occur, looking at different community assets in uh, these different categories of people or society, our built environment or infrastructure, our natural environment or natural resources, and then uh, economy is kind of built into there too. And when we look at the overlap, we can think about the risk and then come up with strategies to mitigate that risk. We do this by working through what I have previously referred to as that community resilience building workshop process. So it's this prescribed process that is used as part of the MVP program and where we are right now is in the virtual workshop part of the process. So the uh, MVP HMP committee has already done A and B where we've prepared for the workshop by meeting behind the scenes and we've characterized those hazards. And now here in the virtual workshops, we are identifying vulnerabilities and strengths for different community assets or components and identifying and prioritizing community actions. In workshop number one, we focused on infrastructural community components here we are in workshop two today, and we will be focusing on environmental uh, strengths and vulnerabilities. And then in the final workshop, we will address societal strengths and vulnerabilities. After the workshops, we will have a post-workshop survey where folks can weigh in and develop uh, a sense of the overall priorities and then uh, put it all together into a plan that will then be presented 
at a public listening session, uh, probably as part of something like a board of selectmen meeting where we will open it up to the whole town of Tolland so that they can weigh in on the process and what came out of it and uh, provide their input on different uh, priorities. So when we're talking at those community components or assets in the town of Tolland, we are categorizing them, um, as I mentioned before, in terms of infrastructure or the built environment, um, which are, we talked about in the previous workshop, and those are things like bridges, roads, culverts, our um, electrical grid. And I, th I think it's the most intuitive for people to understand in terms of natural hazard risk. Today, we'll be talking about environment and our natural resources, which are really important. Um, as strengths in terms of responding to and recovering from natural hazard events. Um, and then the final one, we will talk about society, the way that we um, as a group can help each other rebound from these natural hazard events and also making sure we're addressing vulnerable populations um, in particular and making sure that they are uh, not left behind in the natural hazard recovery process. So when we're thinking about environmental assets, kind of some things that we want to keep in mind are, what are the natural resources that are important to the community? And I already mentioned that Tolland has an abundance of uh, wooded areas. There are also your beautiful lakes uh, and all sorts of wetlands and streams as well. And we wanna be thinking about the benefits that those natural resources provide. Um, there are some examples here like erosion control. If you've got vegetated slopes going down to a stream, those trees and plants hold the dirt in place and keep it from washing away. Uh, water quality improvement is a major benefit provided by wetlands and what are called buffer areas. So the vegetated areas next to water bodies, um, they absorb the rainwater and they they clean the water before it goes into a water body and provide a lot of water quality improvement. Um, slope stabilization, as I mentioned, um, and then also recreational benefits and public health benefits. We wanna think about which natural resources are exposed to both current and then potentially those future natural hazards as those are changing over time. Uh, what have been the effects of hazards on those natural resources? And then think about particularly where the high risk areas are and the vulnerabilities that exist for your natural resources so that we can come up with ways to protect those. So that all being said, at this point, we are now going to go into uh, what is called the risk matrix and actually identify those environmental strengths and vulnerabilities relative to natural hazards for the town of Tolland. So I'm going to end my slideshow here and turn it over to Mimi, who will be putting up the spreadsheet. All right, can everybody see that? Great. Yes. All right, so up here is last week's features, <clears throat> vulnerabilities and strengths for infrastructure and Ready to go for environmental. Do we classify all our lakes as one or each one individually? It is completely up to you. If your different lakes have different concerns or reasons that they are strengths or vulnerabilities, you're welcome to uh, list them out separately, particularly if you think there might be a mitigation action that is specific to one uh, location as opposed to you know, them as a whole. Uh, I'd I, I just say, the lakes period. Do you want to give more information about, um, you know, uh, either how their strengths or how they're vulnerable to natural hazards? And you know, maybe different for different lakes too. I would say 
in general their strengths because um, they add to the recreational um, assets of the community. Are they at risk, do you think, for anything with rising temperatures like um, algal blooms or do you guys have any concerns about um, anything like that? Yeah, I know. Uh, Go ahead, Pat. I, I know up here by Otis Reservoir, every year they drop it in the winter eight foot and then we refill in the spring. And that's um, been a huge benefit for us because it kills the roots for the um, the shallow growing weeds, which keeps it a really uh, a really clean lake. Uh, I suppose if we um, have shorter uh, winters, we it may be a less effective way of controlling the weeds. Jeff, did you have something else to add on that? Yeah, uh, Cranberry Pond, I know they're dealing with some erosion around there, especially beach erosion. And they've also had some invasive uh, species of weeds that have uh, gotten into their pond that they've been working on the last couple of years to try to uh, eradicate that. Um, another strength for the lakes that we have as well is they pretty much all serve as our water source for the fire department. Uh, we don't have any hydrants in town, so we rely on whatever type of standing water or running water that we have in town. So do you have dry general, hydrants? Do you have dry hydrants yes. next to them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Most of them. Uh, nothing up on the reservoir uh, yet. I think that's something that's in the works, but uh, Tunks's Club, um, the pond over there, and then Cranberry Pond both have dry hydrants on them. And then we also have, uh, you know, not, not a lake, but standing ponds um, along 57 and some of the other roads in town uh, also have those dry hydrants, which, you know, is a strength, but also it's something we're going to have to think about as a weakness uh, with these possible droughts that we might have to deal with in the future, like we deal with a couple, dealt with a couple of years ago, where a lot of our water source in town dried up. So if we ever had some type of a large fire, uh, that required water, uh, we were have to, going to have to rely on other towns to bring water into us. All right, can you just explain what you mean by dry hydrant? Yep, so a dry hydrant, yeah, so a dry hydrant is just a, it's a pipe that's laid uh, underground that a fire truck can hook into and pull the water from the pond or stream or lake that that hydrant is attached to. Yeah, it's so because it's they a, have, yeah, they have no water system. And so there's no true hydrant, you know, that's connected yeah. into a, a water line. And so it's just, you'll just see like a little pipe sticking up near a water body and it's connected to the water body so that the fire department can use that water. So yeah, if no they pressure to, right. So if there's a drought, then there's no water for fire suppression. Uh, What town would you be getting water from in that in a situation like that? Would it be Otis? So we have a what's uh, called a tanker task force, and we would see uh, water tankers from I believe on our first alarm. There's four different towns that'll come. So that's Granville, Sandusfield, West Hartland, and Otis. They all utilize the dry hydrant locations to refill their trucks, Jeff? They do. So in a, in a period of drought, if we didn't have a, an active dry hydrant or one that could keep up with the water demand, that means we'd be tasking other towns, you know, going further out to bring water in as well.
Another so asset are our forests. So those are also probably strength and vulnerability. As a strength, they're recreational areas. Um, they help absorb a lot of carbon. As a vulnerability, if there's a fire, there can be a big problem. They also help our, our cool, it keeps the temperatures cool also. Yeah, they're gonna be helping with preventing that drought as well um, in, in the, you know, a general watershed area. Um, it's really good to have a nice forested uh, watershed around your water bodies. They also create lots of habitat for wildlife. It seems like you guys have some nice, you know, big connected stretches of uh, protected area in town. which is especially good for habitat when they're contiguous like that. Do you guys see a lot of invasive species in town? Do you know? Um, do things like the, that can really damage a forest like woolly adelgid or uh, gypsy moths. Yeah, we're seeing the, the emerald ash borer right now mm -hmm. is, is just going through the, the ash trees up here. Terrible. And we're starting to see more uh, oak tree damage, which I'm sure is from the uh, the gypsy moth as well. Woolly adulgid came through probably about 10 years ago. Didn't cause a, a large amount of damage. Um, and we still see it periodically, but it's, it's nothing that's ever really devastated a whole section of hemlocks or anything like that that I've seen. I will correct myself. Gypsy moth is, um, has been renamed yes. to the spongy moth. Spongy moth. moth. Yes. Spongy moth. Yeah. Spongy moth. Spongy. Like S P O N G Y. <clears throat> along with those, um, this the forest impacts. I know along roadsides with them. Um, like the maple sugar, um, sugar maple decline. Um, that's kind of just a vast um, across the states, especially in roadside sugar maples and um, and beech bark disease. I just I notice a lot of the debris that I that I find in the roads are mostly either ash, sugar maple, or um, or beech. So that just goes along with the, the invasives and whatnot. Do the sugar maples on roadsides, are, is it mostly because they're vulnerable to road salt or are there other issues that affect them in particular, do you know? Yeah, I think, I mean, they, I think it's an ongoing study, but I mean, it sounds like road salt and then just the warming temperatures and there's multiple environmental factors that seem to be um, adding to their decline. I don't think it's just one thing, but you know, in rural areas like, you know, town there there used to be you know streets lined with sugar maple so there's still you know remnants around i think there's I a fungus a huge hazard but it's just yeah i think there's a fungus too that's affecting sugar maples that's related to increasing temperatures right yeah yeah multiple factors yeah I don't know if it would be considered a vulnerability, but there's a lot of dead wood in, in the forests here. I know certainly on our property, 
Uh, previous logging has left behind lots of dead wood, dry ice, ice storm damage, things mm -hmm. like that. In some cases, the state considers that a habitat improvement for the small animals. Definitely in streams, you want to leave anything that falls in a stream or wetland, you want to leave it there because it's really good habitat for all sorts of critters. Does the town have its own wetlands bylaw or um, is it just the, uh, the Wetland Protection Act? Jim, you want to take that one? Uh, yes, uh, Jim Deming. We don't have our uh, our own individual wetland bylaws. We just rely on the state one. Gotcha. And um, how do you guys feel about how your your wetlands how that works for the town? Does it seem like that's uh, sufficient for protecting the wetlands that are in town? from development? I, um, I've it's, always it's, found it pretty effective. I have as well. Um, our, our wetlands are pretty well identified mm. and, um, and, and respected. So um, I don't think there's I don't think we have an issue with that. And, okay, and as far as the, the earlier about the comment earlier about the amount of um, lumber and stuff of dry wood in the in the forest stuff for previous long past few years they ten years ago they changed regulations from the street. So the law now after everything it's, it's, it's. sorry jim you're you're breaking up a little bit uh couldn't quite i know you were talking about a change in the regulations related to logging but i couldn't quite catch uh the rest of what you were saying right process uh, so you don't have so much drug i would out in the woods as potential hazards Yeah, I had a hard time getting that. Sorry, you are cutting in and out. Forestry regulations had changed about, I think, 10 or 15 years ago now, that when they're logging, they can't, when they top the trees, they get all these big tops. And Sorry. Is it possible to put that in the chat? That's a good idea. And I think um, from what I could hear um, Jim try and say is um, that logging jobs usually they require the fort or the loggers to um to leave the slash below a certain height and to um to sometimes remove the tops. I think that's what I was getting from. So there so there is some type of um, regulation for the under the forest plans when somebody does the timber harvest. At least that's what I was kind of, again, he was saying. And, um, you know, is it your experience that people are good with complying with the forest management plans? Yeah, it hasn't seemed to be a problem. Everything that I've seen that's, that's happened in town and mm -hmm. our business is kind of directly related to the logging business. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it seems like they have a good handle on uh, what the state requires and, and they, they're pretty cognitive of sticking to that plan. Good to hear. Yeah. Can I make a quick comment? Absolutely, Steve. Um, I, as far as the deadfall and the slash from forest operations, I think it's both a vulnerability and an asset. 
because, you know, as far as forest fires, yes, it increases the uh, amount of fuel. But on the other hand, it's also replenishing the forest floor. Um, it's rebuilding the soil. Um, it's, it, it, when, the, uh, when the wood rots down, it, it, it's improving the soil, which is improving the strength of the trees and the plants around it. So I don't know if you could categorize it as one or the other. I think it's in both categories. Yeah, it adds to fuel, but also the nutrient cycle. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Re relative to the first comment on under wetlands, no wetlands bylaws, I don't think it's terribly practical to expect a little town like Tallinn to enact their own bylaws. Um, it just doesn't, we don't have the expertise or the money to hire an outside consultant to do them. And I don't know what we'd accomplish any better than the state bylaws accomplish or the, the state regs accomplish. Yeah, if if you guys are finding that the, the state bylaw is sufficiently protecting your wetlands, then it's, I mean, it's the state bylaw for a reason. It exists for you to use it. Um, a lot of communities opt to use what's called the 53G uh, option to have developers pay into a fund that then is what pays for the hiring of an outside consultant to review uh, complex applications. But if you are feeling that the uh, Wetlands Protection Act is act, you know, sufficiently protecting your wetlands, then you know, it's, it's no knock on you guys to be using that. Would I you also think, well, go ahead. Um, I was just going to hopefully add quickly. I, I think that a, um, I mean, maybe something that makes everything on the list so far of vulnerability is that um, what Emily was saying, just going back to watershed protection, you know, since we've got MDC um, to the south, you know, the um, Bark Hampstead Reservoir area, and then we've also got land. Um, from Springfield Water and Sewer. So just watershed um, protection as a whole for, for every one, I guess. Yeah, you, you beat me to a cat. I don't know if we, were, oh. we should categorize the, uh, the brooks and streams that come out of our wetlands uh, separately or include it in wetlands, but they're a, a major uh, asset because they, like Kate just said, they feed the reservoirs around us, whether it's uh, the Bark Hampstead Reservoir in Heartland or the Colbrook Reservoir or, or Springfield Waterworks. Do you guys know if you have um, cold water? streams in town those are really nice i bet you do those are really nice uh resources if you have a cold water stream it's a super good habitat for a lot of species uh, like trout i would think most most of our streams are cold water streams because mm -hmm. most of them do have trout in them mm -hmm. let's see According to Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, you do have, it's calling Haley Brook or Hale, Hale Brook. It's calling it both Hale Brook and Haley Brook. I don't know if those are two different names or two names for the same thing. And I think uh, the same thing. Yeah. You can never quite trust how they're naming things. And then there's one down by Ward's Pond that's uh, a cold water stream as well by DFW's definitions, uh, and Babcock Brook, called Cold Water Fisheries Resources. So there's or, three you know, that they're defining as cold water? There, there's more than, well. Yeah, is there a pond, or maybe I'm looking at green. Yeah. Babcock Taylor Brook. Brook. Yeah. I can't see, what this other one isn't one named. One Taylor Brook, she said. I'm just on the website. I yeah. think. I think right. All right. Now. Yeah, I can. We can look. 
yeah, we can add that in later. Uh, those are just really nice resources to protect. Um, they're not as common as they used to be in the state because of the increase in temperatures. And they're really important habitat resources for both insects and fish. And so they're really highly prioritized uh, by the state if you are looking for state funding for replacement of culverts. Um, cold water fisheries are high priority for that. Uh, Pond Brook is on that list too, Mimi. Emily? Yes. Uh, question, what site are you on to find those brooks? Yeah, sure. I will put it in the chat. It is called the Mass Mapper, and it is MassGIS's um, online map where you can zoom into the town of Tolland, and then there are all these different layers that you can turn on and off. Um, I just use, um, actually, Mimi, can I just share my screen really quickly? Yeah, although I could just go to it. Uh, I, I already have it up. I'll just share it really quickly oh, okay. and then give it back to you. So um, if you go to Mass Mapper, well, it, there we go. And then we zoom into Tolland. Here you are. Then there's all sorts of things you can look at. I always just use the search tool here because I don't want to have to bother going through all of these different things to find what I'm looking for. But I know I'm looking for cold water fisheries. There it is. And you can see what the state has mapped, the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife has mapped as these um, really special cold water resources within Tolland. There's other things you can turn on like uh, wetlands and um, you know, other different environmental and uh, regulatory features. It's, it's a really cool site, really fun to play around with. Thank you. No problem. Back to you, Mimi. Are the wetlands kind of distributed all through town or are there certain areas where you'd say there are more wetlands? I think they're pretty much distributed throughout town thinking about it. Um, yeah, I don't think of any part of town that's more heavily uh, swampy or wetlands than any other part. It is a possible environmental strength, the fact that we have two acre minimum lots. Consequently, if there is a problem, um, the housing, with the exception of a couple of the older sections in town, is pretty well distributed. Yeah, and that's also an environmental strength in terms of uh, wastewater disposal as well. Um, and protecting, you know, keeping, because you have large lot sizes, it means that there, if there is a, a wastewater system failure, you're likely to be able to find a good spot on that same lot uh, that's still, you know, a nice safe distance away from everybody's drinking water supply. No, I don't know if this, not opening up a can of worms per se, but I don't know if it's a one line item. Um, and it might be a, a vulnerability, but just the fact that you know, we've got uh, in North Holland, Otis Reservoir, we have Noise Pond, we have um, Wildwood, the, the reservoir in, in there, it, the name escapes me, but, uh, and there's, there's their uh, Cranberry Pond. They're highly developed for the most part with surrounding houses. So 
So in a way, you know, I mean, that's not something we can mitigate because it's already existing, but just the fact that it might be, you know, in a, God forbid, a devastating, you know, uh, storm event, it might be a vulnerability, you know, depending on, you know, there's that just creates a lot of surrounding debris and potentially pollution um, to a water source, which, like I said, it can't be mitigated because it's already developed. So I don't know if that's even something worth putting on the list. You know, I think it's, I think I mean, it's, it's kind of a, about, I mean, <laughs> I don't know if it has to go on there because I guess I'm kind of stretching it a little bit because that's not something that, you know, it's, it's an existing thing. But. Yeah, I think it's worth putting on the list because there are strategies other than, you know, just like picking up and moving people, you know, you could develop like uh, communication plans or public education and outreach materials, you know, and things like that. So there's, there's definitely things you can do to minimize impacts, even if you can't prevent them um, in, yeah. uh, in areas like that. Which ones did you say besides those two? Oh, uh, Otis Reservoir, Cranberry Pond, and Noise, Noise Pond, that's Tungsis, right? Yep, Noise Pond, that's N-O-Y-E-S. Okay, so we have just a, a few more minutes to uh, think about this. And I guess I will just ask if, about um, your recreational spaces. You know, if you have like open spaces or passive recreation spaces that are uh, used by a lot of folks in the town besides those privately owned um, pond associations. Uh, technically, I guess the state forest would all be classified as a recreational space. You're talking about Tallinn State Forest or other? There's more than that, right? That's the primary. Tallinn State Forest is the primary one in town. The um, all Granville State Forest also. That's right, yep. Yeah. The, the MDC and the Springfield Water Works restrict access to their um, properties in, in general. We also have the, the Tonks State Forest um, in West Heartland that connects to Tolland as well. What was the name of that? Tuxit? Tonks. Oh, right. That same name that got me last time. Is that right? Yep, that's right. We have a comment from Jim in the chat that says, Colin. I guess Tallinn's current zoning regulations require existing road frontage. Tallinn has a very restrictive subdivision bylaw that will most likely never be utilized. I think that's what is supposed to be there. Um, therefore, there is a limit to potential development. Kim, did I, did I translate that correctly? Thanks, and then one last thing that I can think of that's not on the list as well as our vernal pools, since we do see some snowpack up here still. Um, we do have the vernal pools, but as the snow becomes less, those will be uh, 
drying up for longer periods of time. Yeah, those of you who don't know very much about vernal pools, I definitely recommend uh, looking them up. They're super interesting natural resources that um, I think weren't well understood until really a couple of years ago. Um, they're really interesting and super important for um, amphibians, for frogs and salamanders, for eggs. Um, they're really, really cool. And really, I'm glad you brought those up, Jeff. Those are a really sensitive resource. You know how many there are certified or potential? I'm not even sure we have any certified. Just, I spend a lot of time in the woods, so I, I tend to see stuff like that. And, uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure if anything's ever been actually documented on them. That's an easy thing to look up to. My, my quick look shows a lot of potential vernal pools and but nothing that has been certified by natural heritage in town. But a lot of potential ones are identified. All right, where are we at on time? It's 8.07. So I think let's take a, uh, a quick couple minute break. Um, just let people, let Mimi's fingers get a rest here uh, from typing and uh, let people get a drink of water or do whatever they've got to do. So let's um, meet back up here in five minutes. Um, and I will remind us all about what mitigation actions are and then we'll dive into that part of, the, of tonight.
Okay, hope everybody had a good little brief break. I am now going to go back into the presentation just for a very brief uh, overview of what mitigation actions are under the considerations of the MVP program um, so that we can brainstorm some of those in order to address the strengths and vulnerabilities we just came up with. So here we go. So now that we've identified um, some of those environmental features that are uh, mostly a combination of strengths and vulnerabilities, we wanna come up with some ways to help protect those strengths and minimize the vulnerabilities so that we can improve the overall resilience of um, tonight focusing on the environmental aspect of the town of Tolland. If we're thinking in terms of the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, and we want these mitigation actions to potentially be funded by the action grant portion of the MVP program, then it's just good to keep in mind what the MVP core principles are. And there are nine, uh, because this is how they score uh, action grant applications. So when, they, when the MVP program is considering action grant proposals to fund, they are looking at whether a project addresses um, those community identified climate change priorities. So what you think the community is most at risk for um, in the future from natural hazards. Uh, they want projects that have robust community engagement portions um, and public outreach. Uh, they like projects that um, uh, don't, aren't just static. You're not just doing a project and then abandon it and move on with your life. They like to see projects that have a plan for implementing that long-term um, and, and keeping it up to date and fresh. They like projects that are proactive rather than reactive. Uh, ones that have benefits to a broad cross-section of the community, so not just benefiting a, a small portion of people. Um, projects that think beyond borders, because you know if you're thinking about natural hazards, they're not confined by town borders. They um, obviously go beyond anything that geopolitical. Uh, that are innovative and transferable, meaning they're projects that other towns could use as well in the future. Um, and then they're also really thinking about projects that prioritize what they call nature-based solutions, which I will get into a little more detail in just a minute. There are three major categories for action grant project types. So when we're thinking about mitigation actions, you can kind of think in these three little bins. Uh, the first is planning assessments, capacity building, and regulatory updates. So these, is, these are your report type of projects where you're doing evaluations or feasibility assessments or um, you know, looking, doing a comprehensive review of all of the regulations in town to make sure they're all using the same data sets and looking forward in the same way. You can do design and permitting projects, for example, for uh, a replacement of culverts or green infrastructure, you can uh, apply for the design and permitting of those. Or you can do actually do uh, construction and on the ground implementation. So you actually can uh, build the things that you have been talking about. Um, a lot of times it progresses in this order where you start off with a, a plan or an assessment and then you go to design and permitting and then you do another round uh, for construction and on the ground implementation. But I uh, just want you to not restrict yourself when you're thinking about mitigation actions to, to solely physical activities or solely uh, assessment type activities, but know that there's a wide range of activities that are possible to be funded under the MVP Action Grant Program. One of the types of projects that they really prioritize are these nature-based solutions projects. Uh, nature-based solutions are projects that um, mimic natural processes. So it's like investigating the root cause of an issue like flooding or erosion and explore solutions that could reverse or mitigate the cause rather than just temporarily treating the, the symptoms. So for example, if you have flooding on a river and you want to minimize the impact of floodwaters on people and buildings, one traditional method that you could use is to build a giant you know, flood wall or levee which is a temporary solution because you are preventing the floodwaters from impacting a specific location, but you're just pushing that floodwater downstream and it's still gotta go somewhere. And so a nature-based solution would be to purchase property and uh, you know, that can be flooded to allow that floodwater to go somewhere 
So it's a natural process. It's still, you know, it's expending that flood water, but in a place that isn't impacting people. So in general, the reason that nature-based solutions are prioritized is both because they mimic these natural processes. And so since they're natural processes, they work really well. Um, they can address multiple hazards like droughts and flooding, erosion, and, um, and too much heat in urban areas. They restore and protect our natural systems, but also they provide a lot of what are called co-benefits. And that's kind of what this diagram that's here on the slide is really getting at, is that when you're using these natural processes to address these natural hazard issue, issues, you also get benefits that um, to societal uh, uh, quality of life, to public health, and then also to things like biodiversity and the environment. So in the example I gave where you're, instead of building a flood wall, you're purchasing a property that uh, can be restored to floodplain and allow a river to flood in that particular area. You're not only preventing the societal problem of flooding that's impacting people, but you're also providing that habitat of floodplain and, um, and also then providing potentially some additional green space or, um, and public benefits in that way. And then to give you some specific examples of nature-based solutions that have been already funded by the MVP program uh, throughout the state, um, there are things from sedimentation studies up in the Essex region, reforestation and municipal tree resilience project in Concord, river restoration in Falmouth, beach nourishment in Oak Bluffs, a green infrastructure as part of a downtown revitalization project in Millbury. Uh, in Northampton, there was a stormwater project related to both detaining and treating stormwater with green infrastructure. And in Southwick, there was a stream crossing replacement project, and which also used upstream nature-based solutions uh, for flood mitigation at the same time. And as a reminder, something we talked about a little bit last time, there are certain types of projects that, while they might be good projects as far as mitigating natural hazards, um, are not competitive under the MPP program. That does not mean we can't include them in our table or consider them. They might be not competitive for MVP, but they might still be competitive for other grant programs. But just so you're aware, projects are not MVP competitive. Basically, if they go against the um, founding purposes of MVP, which was created under the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Reduction Executive Order uh, of Governor Baker. So things that relate to uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not going to be MVP competitive. So uh, diesel generators, um, tree removal, uh, Anything that is related directly to emergency preparedness without increasing climate change uh, or including consideration of climate change or increasing above current conditions. So academic studies, um, it was emergency preparedness projects. Uh, and it, this says FEMA HMPs, but we actually do have a plan, you know, our planning grant right now is for updating the hazard mitigation plan or HMP. Um, so we're doing that under the planning grant, not the action grant. And then if you are just doing a feasibility study related to solar or solar battery systems, that is not MVP competitive, although you can ask for funding for installation of a solar or solar and battery system. So now that we know it's not competitive, I just thought I'd give you some examples to kind of get your brain going in the direction uh, specific to environmental projects. So this could be things like what I mentioned, protecting or managing floodplain or flood zone lands. Uh, green infrastructure is always a very popular project because you're um, managing stormwater, which is you know, obviously a concern in our area with those changing precipitation patterns. And by using green infrastructure measures, you're hitting that nature-based solutions category. And so you get prioritized for funding. Uh, you could stabilize vulnerable slopes with native vegetation, although that doesn't seem to be too much of a concern. Uh, forest management plans are always really popular uh, ideas to consider. You know, they won't fund removal of trees, but you, you can ask for funding to develop a plan or a management plan. Um, or maybe even something like coordination with your state parks is also an option as a, a mitigation action, um, even for something uh, as uh, general as the evacuation procedures and making sure everybody's on the same page. So that being said, I will turn it back over to Mimi and we will go back to the matrix and we will take 
our vulnerabilities and strengths that we just identified a few minutes ago and try to come up with some of those mitigation strategies or actions to address those. Oops, and I need to stop sharing so that you can. There we So I guess if we're going to start at the top, I don't know if there's, you know, we talked a lot about the, um, the dry hydrants and the, the risks associated with drought for those. I don't know if there's any actions that um, you can think of that might minimize the risk with that. Yeah, actually, um, I, I did write that down. I was just trying to count how many dry hydrants we had in town now. I believe we only have six. And two years ago, during the drought that we had in the 2020, uh, we were down to really only one that was usable. Um, so I think if we could develop maybe some type of a stormwater um, retention, kind of like what uh, Northampton did to, you know, retain the, the runoff from these maybe large storms that we get uh, in between the drought periods. To... Like a cistern? Exactly. Yeah, cistern or retention pond. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like kind of a win-win where you're you're managing stormwater and then utilizing it as well. And maybe with dealing with the uh, the invasive weeds with some of our, our private communities that are on these ponds, maybe uh, education on how to properly take care of those. Uh, I know Wildwood community in Cranberry Pond, they, uh, they went a chemical route uh, two years ago. Um, I'm not sure what they had for results out of that, but maybe there's something more natural like Pat said with just a, a larger drawdown in the wintertime that could help alleviate some of the the invasive weeds that they're getting. No, I guess it depends on how severe they're at, but maybe creating like a man, like an invasive management plan if they were that bad in the lakes, which it kind of sounds like they already have. Yeah, I think in general, um, invasive species public education is a really cool topic. A lot of people don't even recognize a lot of the plant species in particular that are invasive species. Um, and so workshops are a really cool way to do that because, um, you know, you can get hands on and see, you know, all of these different things that are actually uh, can be really harmful. Um, and I think an invasive management plan is a really good idea too.
You know, I realized I just wrote in that part about nutrients, but you didn't say that, did you? You were just talking about invasives. I don't know if there is a problem with just general um, plant growth, too much plant growth because of nutrients. I do know there's a weird problem in one of the ponds that I read about somehow where it was not dredged properly when it was when the pond was put in and so there's like these weird chunks of stuff that float up to the top <laughs> yeah that would be cranberry pond yeah sure they're still dealing with uh with a lot of that stuff that like peat right like floats to the that, top the peat, yeah. peat floats to the surface still yeah that can't help with uh with supporting with you know providing the nutrients you know it can't help with the vegetation Was there a certain um, certain ponds or lakes where you were thinking the stormwater retention ponds would be put in, or I mean, or certain areas where those would be? I think that's something that Kate could probably really help us on with seeing where she's dealing with most of the the stormwater runoff with her roads, possibly, and in, in uh, rediverting that naturally into a retention pond, but. I don't know if you've seen really too much of that yet, just coming out of winter. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. Last summer, if I was there last, if I was here last summer, that would have been, that'd be a, a good Ed question. <clears throat> but, yeah. Yeah, and you know, that's one of those types of things that it could start with a study where you identify, you know, all the town properties and figure out where the good spots would be um, before you then get into design and permitting. Emily, this is kind of a double-edged sword question. Um, have you seen studies that have been done for forest canopy uh, that are along roadways um, to maybe do some type of management along roadways to let more light in so we would have to use less road salt where you get more natural melting instead of uh, dealing with you know, the, the problems that can happen from salt? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I haven't seen it from that perspective relative to de-icing, um, but that's a really interesting one. And it, it, the, the conflict would potentially be, you know, with your public shade tree uh, protection, I think. But if you're just trimming or thinning rather than, you know, actually removing trees, uh, that could be an interesting one. I think it's worth considering. I mean, there are also alternatives to road salt. I know as part of the, the MS4 program, um, you know, they're trying to encourage people to look at alternatives to both sand and salt, although it's complicated and potentially expensive. So, so Mimi, what we're talking about is um, forest canopy management to allow for more sunlight on the roads and more natural uh, melting as opposed to use of road salt. Okay. Hey, there's Steve, you got the, the computer working. <laughs> so Jeff, you wanna make our mud season longer. <laughs> <laughs> so actually <laughs> that idea just came from, we, we dealt with a large parking lot uh, for a, a large industrial place years ago. And they actually brought a, a person in that, that did this, just that they trimmed the, uh, the trees on the edge of the parking lot. They didn't cut them down. They just allowed more light to come in and it provided more melting. So less salt had to be used in their parking lot. Uh, on a, a different issue, 
there are one or two places in town where we have beaver issues, mm. which tend towards um, uh, it tend, tends to make some local flooding. Is a uh, beaver management program uh, an allowable pro program? We definitely can consider it. Um, I don't know a whole ton about beaver management strategies. I know it's a very kind of complicated topic. Um, I know the use of something like beaver deceivers would not be open arm welcomed because they are not beneficial to other critters that are trying to get through the same culverts. Um, but it's definitely, if beavers are an issue, it's definitely worth investigating a beaver management program uh, because their issues can really exacerbate the flooding that we're you know, seeing more of. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. I know with in the Heartland, you deal with uh, beaver situations quite a bit over mm -hmm. there. Yeah, we've had a little problems on the east side. Uh, not too much. There's a couple of co couple areas on the west side, but we've actually had them removed, um, knowing that uh, they have caused problems. In the west side, a little bit closer to Riverton, they were flooding across the road. And then in East Heartland, we've been having problems with some of our dry hy hydrants due to some damage done by the beavers. Well, kind of while we're down on this end of the table, you know, when you were we were talking about the fact that you guys have a lot of potential vernal pools and none that are certified, um, is there any interest in um, trying to get the vernal pools certified in town that provides some additional protection under the Wetlands Protection Act? Yeah, I don't see why not. But no, now when you suggest that, Emily, are you suggesting we do it on town-owned land? state-owned land, privately owned land, or what? Usually when you do something like that, um, you either train a group of volunteers or you hire a consultant um, because there are these forms and documentation that you need to provide to natural heritage to have them certified. And I think normally um, it's on both public and private land. And then as part of the process, you obtain landowner permission to go on their property to check out the vernal pool. And if they say no, then you don't go there. Thank you. Yeah, they're not, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it would be a, a combination of uh, the, the work would be done, the work is not done by National Heritage, but they accept or do not accept the documentation that you provide. Um, just as a matter of clarification, they won't, they don't really come out and do the field work. I don't think they have enough staff. You think that's unclear how I wrote it? We can, I can um, flesh that out in the after notes. <laughs> Just to be clear that it would be volunteers or uh, you know, an outside consultant that would be actually doing the, the work. I mean, volunteers would be cool if, if that would be possible or some sort of combination of the two. Mm, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, Nina. Thank you. Amelia, I had a question. Sure, um, Based on what we shared about the excess heat from Cranberry Pond, can you take that heat and then use it for forest management and maybe like helping with decomposition and things like that? Like what's happening? With the uh, that I don't know. We don't have our normal folks um, who are on the committee who would know more about that. Unless you know, Pat. Yeah. I do not. Yeah, I think Alan was the one who was talking about that the last time. That's an interesting question. I think we'll just, I'll just have that as a side question. What do they do with the peat once they 
fish it out. <laughs> Emily? Mm, yes. I see. Yeah, I believe they take the peat, they, they tow it to the shore, and they put it in, in, in part of their woodlands. So just as you're suggesting, Jacinta, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Amy, do you mind scrolling back over to the side just so we can see the, the justification, some of the justification stuff uh, for the any categories we haven't come up with in action yet? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. What about the reservoirs and ponds that are highly developed? <clears throat> Do you have some ideas or action items for that? And I'm all about public education and outreach. I don't know if you guys think that that's feasible or would be well received, but I always think that those are good programs to suggest, you know, to just um, uh, give people more information about uh, how their actions impact where they live and how they can help improve the, particularly like the water quality or prevent erosion in these um, and protect the, the reason that they live there is because it's, you know, on these beautiful ponds. So help keep them that way. So I'll go right. Hmm. Emily, you could also maybe add to that protecting native species. Oh. I mean, that just kind of goes back to invasives and then, mm -hmm. you know, just native uh, plants and vegetation. Yeah, I'm really feeling like it would be cool to do a workshop or a series of workshops about um, native species versus invasive species. Um, because it's so easy to buy species or just let them exist that really are not helpful and can be super harmful. Um, and a lot of people don't know what they look like or how bad they can be. Yep. Yeah, I think we could get a lot of buy-in from our, our private lakefront communities on that too, because I know they are very um, proactive in trying mm -hmm. to keep invasive species out of their ponds. That makes sense. You know, if you live in a beautiful kind of nature-based area, then native species are the way to go because then you get more critters too. You get a lot more birds and uh, meat, butterfly and insect species as well. Well, I guess one other thing that I wanted to ask you guys about was, you know, we had talked about that relatively high risk from wildfire and just to see if you guys had any thoughts on anything that could be done um, either physically or uh, in regulatory terms or in public education terms related to the environment with minimizing that risk from wildfires. It's not a leading question. I don't have any particular thoughts. Just wondering if there's anything that would come to mind. I mean, I know this kind of goes, I don't know, it's not, I mean, kind of goes back to the infrastructure side of things, but I know that there's a lot of, you know, tree and um, storm damage built up along the roadsides, um, you know, and they're on the edge of the road, so it's in the right of way, but sometimes, you know, on private landowners, but like I said, that's kind of infrastructure. I'm not, I guess it could go under a budding yeah. force, you know, to the roadside, because I noticed that. 
mean, there's a lot of storm damage in town, just not along the roadsides in the woods and you know, due to past tornadoes and mm. microbursts and whatnot. You guys had that tornado not too long ago. Going along with that, um, this is Paula. Um, going along with that, again, I go back to um, private landowners perhaps finding ways to manage their own forests better. I know we would like to be able to. Um, is there, I think we mentioned at a previous meeting, you talked about um, having a, someone from the forestry uh, department be able to come out and give you an assessment. I know, and it was very expensive to do that, but um, I wonder if there could be, again, another maybe public education um, way to get that information to people uh, about what they can do to manage their land better. You know, we don't want to take away those natural wild habitats, but certainly, you know, cleaning up roadsides. We're having a, a cleanup in a few weeks here, and we'll be cleaning up our roadsides from all the winter trash debris. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, that kind of thing, just more public education about how we can manage our forests more efficiently. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we've got maybe like five more minutes here. If it, um, there's anything else that occurs to anybody or anything, um, anything they want to add. And, and as before, this is not, you know, like a speak now or forever hold your peace type of situation. We'll, we'll have some time if something occurs to you after the fact, you know, if you've had time to absorb all of this, um, you'll have a chance to add that in. But um, if you're inspired in the moment, uh, feel free to We've got about five more minutes. Emily? Yeah. It, it's Steve. W would adding dry hydrants come under this? We can definitely put it on our list. I'm not, just adding dry hydrants on its own is probably not a super competitive MVP action grant project, but you could make it part of a larger project, like with the stormwater um, as well. So it's it's definitely, it's right. something that's important to you guys. It's, it's good to have it on the list. I think, should I put that in infrastructure? Okay, thank you. Yeah, we might, we might move that piece. It's kind of, some of these are a little bit tricky in terms of whether they're environment or infrastructure. Um, you know, I think that I can see that being in either or both. Well, if, it, if it's protecting, if it's, if it's protecting the environment yeah. by keeping the uh, wildfires down, wouldn't that yeah. be part of that? Yeah, I, I think for now, I think it's okay to leave it here, Amy, both because it is tied to the water source and as Steve mentions, um, the wildfire risk for the forest. And that way you don't have to do the work of moving it to the infrastructure run. <laughs> Do the work of erasing. <laughs> I think that was my idea with the whole, you know, mm -hmm. collecting the stormwater and retention ponds was to have additional, mm -hmm. you know, sources of water during those dry periods if we possibly could collect the, the, the major rainfalls that came on either end of those dry periods to, to try mm -hmm. to hold it. So. Yeah, that makes sense. I think we came up with some really interesting stuff tonight. Um, I think these are you know, already really promising starts to action grant ideas that I'm kind of, <laughs> I can already picture the application in my head. So these are really good ideas that we've been coming up with tonight. Uh, so we'll just ponder for a few more minutes and then I will uh, wrap it up for this evening. I mean, one thing that I don't know if we could add just, it kind of ties in with infrastructure. So wetlands, brooks and streams. So, I mean, there's, you know, culverts that obviously carry, you know, either wetlands and or brooks or streams across town. Um, 
but just tying that into um, like if we have a culvert, you know, where we've got to replace obviously, but tie in like bank restoration, you know, if there's hot areas of high erosion, you know, where we're going to be replacing a culvert, which is related to infrastructure, but there could also be some environmental restoration in certain areas, those areas I'm not quite sure, but I don't know if that's worth adding to those columns. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's, yeah, we'd mentioned an infrastructure and I know you weren't able to make it for that one. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, those potentially undersized culverts and replacing those culverts. And I think it's really important for your cold water streams in particular to, um, if you are replacing those to be thinking about replacing those with um, culverts that meet the Massachusetts stream crossing standards so that you're protecting the integrity of the cold water resource. And then stream bank erosion or restoration at the same time is uh, really neatly ties into that. Yep. Kind of another one that I was thinking of that ties back to something we had talked about in infrastructure. And I know this isn't exactly in Tolland. We had talked about on Route 57, there are some kind of sketchy <laughs> eroding bank areas. And so just one thing that, to, you know, if that ends up, uh, becoming more of a thing, you know, would be stabilizing those slopes using native vegetation would be um, a good MVP type of project. Where is this? Where, Emily? What, what is I think in infrastructure, weren't we talking about Route 57 and there were some areas they're not, I think, maybe in Tolland. Um, this would be up in infrastructure, but just kind of tying it to the, <laughs> what we've been talking about. Um, Thought it was. It's under evacuation routes, I think. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I think those oh, are mainly right. on the north end, um, yeah, the west side of town. Right. It was. I was just kind of thinking about how we've been talking about how they're eroding, and so when if we're looking at those and potential solutions, it would be great to consider, you know, using vegetation and vegeta uh, vegetated slopes for to mitigate that erosion instead of just you know going straight to putting in riprap or something like that although the, obviously that will involve uh discussions with these other communities since they're i, I believe on that slope go ahead steve i, I was going to say on that slope i don't think there's much of a vegetative uh, species you could put in there that, that, that is really going to do anything. Mm, is it, it really it's, steep? It's, it's, it, it, you're talking Route 57 going out of Collin into Sandersfield. And, and it's mostly rock. Mm, gotcha. Don't do <laughs> vines. <laughs> don't do some don't bitters. Grow anywhere. <laughs> Vines, sweet and grapevines. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is, I think, a really productive uh, brainstorming session. So, I appreciate everybody's thoughts. So, I'm just going to share again, just very quickly, for one or two slides, uh, just to kind of wrap us up here. Oops. Right side. There we go. There we go. Okay, so uh, now that we have gone through this process for the environmental assets, uh, we are going to continue outreaching to stakeholders to kind of drum up uh, participation in the process. Um, and we are going to have our third workshop, which is the last one in this process uh, next week. So same time, same place, different date. Uh, next Wednesday, seven to nine. Uh, and that will be focusing on our societal assets, on our vulnerable populations and our community ties and strengths that help Tolland uh, recover from natural hazard events. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, once we uh, finish with our workshop process, we will have a prioritization survey where that table that we've all been working on will be cleaned up and finalized. And then we'll put together a survey that allows um, people to 
look at everything we've talked about and um, give it uh, a high, medium, or low priority, and then identify their overall top priorities for those mitigation actions. Um, after that, we will then have, uh, we will continue meeting as a core group and putting together the MVP plan and HMP plan update. And then we will kind of culminate with a, what's called the public listening session in the May, June timeframe, where it'll be a big public meeting um, where we will invite everybody to uh, weigh in on the process and the mitigation actions and priorities. Will that meeting, Emily, be a uh, in-person meeting or a um, Zoom? Totally up to you guys. Totally. A lot of a lot of communities have been meeting in person. I'm uh, amenable to that option, particularly if you think that it would get more participation. Um, you know, I think that's definitely uh, worth keeping on the table. Or if you think virtual is the way to go, we can do that too. And that's all I have on my end. Um, so if anybody has any questions or anything they would like to discuss, I am happy to do so. Um, otherwise, I would like to say thank you everybody for spending two hours with us on your Wednesday night to talk about all this process. I think we had a really productive evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.